for message. Ta -da. Go ahead, Marty, take it away. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Marty Haverin. I'm a Texas master naturalist. So one of the things that I'm interested in, in terms of volunteer activities, is this um, Dark Skies initiative uh, that the um, Observatory has underway. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, see if I can share my screen and we'll get this started. So Laura, is my screen now um, visible now? Yes. For anybody. Yeah, no, it's good. Now. Yeah, we see it. We see it. Okay. 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 So you guys, just so you know, I'm going to mute everybody. And then if, and so that when Marty's talking, we don't hear all kinds of reverberation. Okay. And then if you want to talk, um, put your hand up or something or type it into the chat box. All right. Okay. Mute me and take over, Marty. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to this presentation about dark skies. Um, you probably already know that um, we're losing dark skies at an accelerating rate um, because of light pollution. So we're going to look into um, how and why that's happening and maybe some steps we can take to uh, preserve the dark skies that we still have and possibly um, even reclaim some of the dark skies that we've lost. Um, as you may know that some of us in the Big Bend are involved in this initiative that the observatory has underway uh, to create a dark sky reserve encompassing uh, multiple counties in West Texas. Um, so if successful, that would be the, the biggest dark sky reserve in the entire world. So we're hoping this presentation will um, stimulate your interest in that. And just um, a disclaimer at the start, I'm not, um, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an astronomer. Um, I just put this information together in a way that made sense to me as a layperson. So, um, you know, you get what you pay for. So we'll go ahead and get started. We need a definition of um, light pollution. And this is provided by the International Dark Skies Association. And it says the inappropriate or excessive use of artificial light. And we have a picture here of a, a light fixture, which is not shielded at all. Uh, it's lighting up the trees, lighting up the skies. This is an example of what we're trying to, to avoid. So we can look at four examples of um, types of light, of light pollution. And let me just ask, is my screen keeping up? Because I know I've had problems before where I'm talking and the screen is not keeping up with my narrative. Is everybody okay now? Somebody? Yeah. Okay, so uh, four examples of um, light pollution would be sky glow, light trespass, uh, glare, and clutter. So we'll look at each one of these. Um, sky glow has human and natural causes. And this picture is the, um, the Los Angeles Basin. And you can see how intense the lighting is um, and how far up into the atmosphere it extends. You've got to go quite a ways up before you can see any stars. So where I live in Libya Crossing, um, if I look to the east, I actually see a version of this because of all of the um, light pollution from the, um, the Permian Basin, the energy industry. Not, not this intense, but it's something that's happening. Um, to give you an idea how fast this is happening, uh, when I moved to Arizona in 2002, I used to go camping at the Kofa National Wildlife Reserve, took my telescope, and it's about 180 miles or so from the Phoenix Central Valley metropolitan area. And when I first started camping there in 2002, the skies were perfectly dark. There was no uh, artificial light visible at all. By the time I left um, Arizona in 2010, you could start to see some, um, some of the sky glow from that Central Valley a good 180 miles away. So that gives you an idea how fast this is accelerating. So we'll look at another example of light pollution. This would be light trespass. 
Light trespasses where the light goes where it's not wanted. And the goal is to keep your light on your property. So here we have on the left, we have um, a motel with um, several light fixtures that are really bright. And one at the top that's very intense. And if we look across the street from that motel, we see the light trespass on this residence across the street. So you can see it's very intrusive. Um, if these people um, are ready to go to bed, they're gonna have to close their windows, I guess, through their shades. Um, when uncles took over the, um, the truck stop that you might know in Balmeray at the intersection of I-10 and Highway 17, um, they installed some really intense light fixtures over the truck parking lot. And uh, my farmhouse at that time was over a mile away. And the light fixture was aimed so badly and so intense and actually, I had to move my bedroom to the rear of the house to avoid the glare, the trespass coming in. So my trespass is another example of light pollution. And we can keep going. This is an example of glare, two examples of glare. So glare is reduced visibility or visual discomfort. And on the left, we have uh, some street lights that are completely unshielded. And presumably, the idea was to light the road and the sidewalk, but you can see the lights going all over. It's lighting up the power lines, trees. Um, it's not restrained at all. And on the right, we have an example of um, a vehicle coming to you with their high beams on. Um, you can see how intense that light is. So this is a safety hazard. You really can't see anything other than that glare. So there might be, you know, large animals in the road, pedestrians. Um, you really can't see anything around around the vehicle. Like in New Jersey, where I come from, the first rule of the of the road is the only good pedestrian is a dead pedestrian. So um, you can see that could happen here because of this uh, this light light glare. Some of the newer vehicles have like automatic dimming now. They call it IntelliBeam. So if your vehicle detects another vehicle coming, it automatically lowers the high beams. So I'm looking forward to when all vehicles have that. And the last example of a light pollution we can look at is clutter. So that would be like bright, confusing, and excessive groupings of light sources. So this is a metropolitan area, and it looks like the, um, the public works department just went crazy <laughs> installing um, so many of these very intense street lights, none of which are shielded. And the lighting is so intense, you can't even see the road. So they probably don't need that many lights or that intensity. So another example of light, of light um, pollution. If we look at a uh, comparison of all these together, in the upper left corner, we have um, light glare. So we have an unshielded light fixture and the light is radiating in all directions. Whereas presumably they just wanted to light up the sidewalk, the bicycle rack, that area. Uh, off to the right of that, the upper right, we have an example of my trespass, where it's going in the window of this, um, of this establishment here. Uh, lower left, we have um, over lighting, or another example of clutter, light clutter. There are three very bright fixtures here. They could probably get by with just, uh, just one of those, instead of all three. And to the right, we have sky glow. Um, looking at this, the outline of these buildings, if you didn't know better, you might think this is um, the dawn or sunset in the background of these buildings, but in reality, it's, it's like pollution coming from sources back there. So um, when did light pollution uh, begin? Who started it? Well, at some point uh, back in the day, some cave guy or cave girl figured out how to make fire. Um, that's how it got started. Um, this gentleman here looks like a distant cousin of mine. Um, eventually, people uh, moved beyond open flames to, um, to oil lamps and candles. So in the upper left, we have examples of um, early uh, candles um, or oil lamps. And these might be fueled by whatever oil was um, handy at that area. So it might be fueled by um, olive oil or sesame oil, um, fish oil, uh, whale oil. Probably most of us know that the story of the Hanukkah candles 
where it had enough fuel to last for one night, but actually lasted for eight nights. Uh, off to the right, we have um, another uh, oil-filled lamp. Um, in the Northeast, where I come from, they call these hurricane lamps because you would use them when the electric power went off. Uh, these were typically uh, fueled by oil, oil and then eventually uh, kerosene. And then, of course, we have candles. The problem with candles is they're easy to tip over, they make a mess, easy to start fires with them. Um, eventually, some of the metropolitan areas went to um, gas lighting. And this is gas lighting as in a source of illumination, not like, you know, telling lies for propaganda purposes. So um, on the left, we have a series of street lamps, and there would be a gas pipe, a gas main running below these. Um, depending on the company providing the gas, um, it would usually be coal gas, maybe with some oil additives or other additives. And an employee of the company would have to go around to each individual lamp, as we see in the center image, and turn on a valve and light the lamp at um, sunset, and then do the reverse again at dawn. So those of us that have maybe um, gas stoves are familiar with you know, keeping a pilot light going. And off to the right are some more decorative uh, gas lamps. At least some of these are shielded from the top, so it's not complete um, light pollution. Now the big advance um, in light pollution was caused by the invention of the electric light bulb, the incandescent light bulb by Thomas Edison um, in 1879. And he gets credit for it, but actually people had been experimenting with that technology going back to the 1830s um, in Great Britain. So the first, um, the first practical light bulb that he came up with on the left hand side here, uh, actually had a bamboo filament. And that bamboo filament was ready to last 1200 hours it's pretty impressive at the time. So in addition to being um, an inventor, Edison was an entrepreneur. So he quickly figured out how to uh, create electricity grids, electric light grids, and electric meters, so he could charge you for the electricity. Um, he invented electric trains. I used to commute to work on one of his electric trains um, in New Jersey. Um, the image off to the far right is um, it's in Menlo Park where he invented um, the light bulb, not far from where I grew up. Uh, so it has like a gigantic light bulb on top and some um, thoughtfully placed light pollution devices down at the bottom here. So this used to be all farmland. Now it's all office parks and shopping centers. And what really has accelerated light pollution uh, starting in this century, the 21st century, is LED lighting. So LED lighting, uh, light emitting diodes, you see an example on the left. And the way they work is um, they use a semiconductor that converts electricity um, into light. Um, that means they can be much smaller than the old incandescent bulbs, which means there's a lot more use for them. Um, they're more energy efficient, they say. Uh, they're also less longer, which can save money. As we said, they can be very small, compact size, um, and they can operate at lower temperature. So these initially started as like displays on computers, like for um, the day the computer power light is on, or um, on a calculator, to show you the, the images on a calculator. Uh, but in the early uh, part of this century, the 2000s, um, different um, government agencies started offering incentives to get people to use these LED lights. So the use has really expanded um, since say 2000. And I checked the, um, some of the local energy companies like Rio Grande Electric and uh, American Electric Power offer incentives to get you to switch the old incandescent bulbs to um, these LEDs. But these have really accounted for a big increase in light pollution. One disadvantage besides so if we take a look at the progression of light pollution over time, uh, we have four images in this graphic, um, starting with the late 1950s in the upper left. And you can see there's only a few um, metropolitan areas where there's really a lot of light pollution. Most of the country still has very nice dark skies. 
If we move to the um, image at the upper right, in the middle 1970s, we can see that the light pollution has really advanced, um, especially east of the Mississippi, so that there's not too many dark skies left in that area. If we go to the lower left, which was 1997, uh, you can see that pretty much everything um, east of the Mississippi is dominated by light pollution. Uh, there's very few dark areas left. Whereas conversely, much of the west of the United States, except for the coastal regions, still has pretty good dark skies. Now they projected to the middle of this decade to 2025 in the last uh, image at the lower right. And we can see how intense the light pollution has become uh, throughout much of the country. And there's really only very limited areas of uh, dark skies left, mainly uh, the mountainous areas. So uh, we take another look at light pollution in an urban setting. Uh, this is Chicago. So the left-hand side shows an aerial view of um, the Chicago area. This is Lake Michigan here. And you can see that in the, the central part of Chicago, the light Morning. is so intense, you really can't distinguish any images. It's just complete light pollution. And the image on the right is that same area. It's just viewed from a distance. So here we see the sky glow is, um, is progressing pretty far up into the atmosphere from all that urban lighting. So if we look specifically at Texas, um, this was taken, this uh, image was created in 2012. So we can see Texas is pretty much dominated by light pollution. There's, there's hardly any areas of dark skies remaining Whereas in West Texas, there's still a lot of dark skies. Um, we have, um, starting from the top of Texas going down, top of West Texas, this is um, Amarillo and then Lubbock. Um, then we can come down to Midland, um, Odessa, uh, Monahans, Pegasus. And if we get down to our area, the Big Bend, uh, we see Alpine, uh, Marfa, and Fort Davis. So we can see there's a lot of dark sky left in West Texas. And one of the goals of um, the, the of as much of this as possible. So um, this is an example of um, wasted light energy at one of the um, oil facilities. This is a, uh, a relatively new um, injection well facility in Bamaray. That's where they take um, water that they were using for injection wells and put it in um, an underground um, storage facility. So um, I took this photo from um, I-10. This is I-10 East here. And you can see how intense the lighting is in there. And much of this is wasted. You can see it all going up into the atmosphere and radiating out laterally. So they probably don't need this many lights and they need to shield the lights, at least tilt them down. And um, given the struggles of the energy industry right now, you would think they would want to save money uh, by um, uh, letting us do an assessment and maybe recommend uh, some energy savings and, and also dark sky friendly lighting for them. So this is something I, I intend to pursue with the, uh, the parent company, uh, Waste Management Services in Houston. Um, they portray themselves as an environmentally friendly company. So um, we'll see if we can hold them to that standard. But this is typical of what's causing the sky glow in our area, say in Jeff Davis County. Okay, so um, light pollution has um, effects on humans as well as um, wildlife. So it says as many species, including humans, need darkness to survive and thrive. This is a conclusion of the American Medical Association in 2012. So we'll look at some effects of light pollution on uh, humans first, and we'll look at, at wildlife. So potential effects on humans, um, according to the AMA, um, light pollution can increase our risk for these things, obesity, depression, uh, sleep disorders, diabetes, uh, breast cancer, and insomnia. And uh, we'll look at how that happens in a minute. But I find it interesting that the AMA, which is a you know, well-respected authority, has come to the conclusion that light pollution um, can have negative effects on health. So um, we have what they call a circadian rhythm. And like 
most life on Earth, um, humans adhere to a circadian rhythm. That's our biological clock. It's um, a sleep-wake pattern governed by the day-night cycle. So artificial light at night you know, can disrupt that cycle. And one of the things that happens is, um, after this girl goes to sleep, one of the things that happens is um, our bodies are supposed to produce uh, this hormone cord called melatonin at night while we're sleeping. And it has a lot of benefits for us. Uh, it boosts our immune system, which would be really important now during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, lowers cholesterol, and it can help the functioning of these glands, the thyroid, pancreas, um, ovaries, testes, and adrenal glands. So if our sleep cycle is di disrupted because of light pollution, we're producing less melatonin, which has a negative effect on our bodies. Um, this graphic is an example of the visible light spe spectrum. And you can see uh, that the part that's visible to us is very limited. Very little of the light spectrum is, is visible to us. And looking at the colors, um, I kind of thought intuitively that the red colors on the right would be the warmest. And the cooler covers, that, like the blue on the left, would be the cooler. But actually, we find out that that's not true at all. Um, if we look at this graphic, which shows the relationship between light and heat, we can see that the um, red part of the visible light spectrum operates at a much higher temperature, excuse me, that the blue part of the um, visible light spectrum operates at a much higher temperature than the red part, which is kind of like the opposite of what I always thought. Okay, so um, a lot of the devices that we use now um, produce what they call blue light, and we just saw that it, it burns at a very high um, temperature, a relatively high temperature. It can be far harmful to our eyes. Um, according to the AMA, blue light increases the risk for cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So I think most of our devices that we use now, um, smartphones, tablets, um, laptops, come with a blue light filter. Um, you might have to activate it. Um, I use a Samsung phone, and I just leave the blue light filter on all the time on my phone. Uh, some of the devices, you might have to download an app. But the AMA is recommending whatever device you use um, that you do um, employ a blue light filter. And given all the time that we use uh, our devices now, we don't want to end up like uh, this poor soul here. Okay, looking at um, light pollution as it affects wildlife, um, we see some wild critters here that are discussing um, the effects of wildlife on them. So it talks about birds. It says that thousands of birds die each year because light pollution distracts them from their natural uh, migrations. And it can also cause them to crash into um, high buildings like skyscrapers. And on the right, this person or this creature is saying, even baby sea turtles have been found heading towards the cities because the artificial light looks to them like the ocean. So they kind of give it a message that we as humans have a responsibility to be aware of all types of light pollution that we create. So we can look at a few specific examples of um, light pollution on wildlife. Um, this graphic here is at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And it's about um, 900 birds that they collected that had crashed into um, skyscrapers, either during the day because the skyscrapers had reflective windows to um, make them more energy efficient, or at night because they were lit up at night and the migrating birds followed each other, uh, crashing into them. So it's about 900 species that they collected in a random sample. And, uh, excuse me, about 2,400 bird um, carcasses or bodies that they collected in a random sample represented 95 different species. This is in one city, uh, Toronto. Um, some people have said that the, um, the wind farms, the wind turbines, um, contribute towards um, bird death. Um, actually, um, skyscrapers or tall buildings account for about 
um, 600 million um, bird deaths per year in the United States. And wind turbines only account for about a half a million. So if we did the math, that's about 0.008% of bird deaths caused by uh, wind farms. Um, one of the things that I do for the American Red Cross is conduct um, first aid classes, uh, which I've done at a couple of the wind farms in our area, uh, one for BP and one for um, Duke Energy. And walking around the bottom of those wind turbines, I have yet to see a dead bird. Um, that doesn't mean it's not happening, but I just have not seen them. Aside from bird deaths, uh, we talked about the sea turtle hatchlings being misdirected. Um, these little guys have a very limited time from when they hatch to get to the ocean because all sorts of predators are looking to, uh, to feed on them as soon as they hatch. Uh, so if um, light pollution distracts them, instead of going towards the ocean, um, the one on this right-hand side is going towards um, a bright interior light, an inland light, and he's right on the medium of a road. Uh, so I hope this um, life insurance is paid up. Um, another example of light pollution is insect decline. Um, I'm sure many of us, well, most of us have seen insects um, flocking towards very bright lights. And the problem with that is instead of um, using their energy to look for food or to reproduce, they're wasting their energy um, trying to get at these bright lights. And that's causing insect decline. Um, I think a lot of us have recognized the decline in fireflies. Um, I remember as a child, I used to see a lot of fireflies around, and now I very, very rarely see one. And part of the reason for that is, is the light pollution. Another example of um, the effect on wildlife would be um, under the water, under the oceans. Uh, this picture is the Great Barrier Reef off the east coast of Australia. And they say that some species of sponges uh, reproduce sexually by producing uh, sperm and eggs. And the release of that sperm and eggs is tied to the cycles of the moon, the phases of the moon. So if the moon phases are um, camouflaged or disrupted by uh, light pollution, it can cause um, the sperm or eggs to be released at the wrong time and they don't match up and reproduce. So it never occurred to me that light pollution could affect wildlife deep below the ocean, but uh, apparently it can. Uh, we can also look at the effect on astronomy. So we have a graphic here ranging from an inner city sky on the left-hand panel to dark skies on the right-hand panel. Um, as a child growing up in New Jersey, I had a very nice view of the night sky. We could see most of the stars very easily. But by the time I left New Jersey in 20, 2002, excuse me, 02, um, I could only see a handful of the brightest stars, except that Sunday night when some of the commercial lighting was turned off. So what we're trying to do is, is um, prevent this from happening on the left-hand panel and keep this on the right-hand panel where we still have it now. Um, the, uh, one of the subdivisions, that Sierra, Sierra de la Rana or Sierra la Rana subdivision south of um, Alpine took a survey of people who visited their websites um, asking them why they were interested in possibly uh, purchasing there. And one of the top reasons was they wanted dark skies so they could engage in astronomy. So um, a lot of people, if you, you try to persuade them not to have as much light in, they cite security. They're concerned about um, the effect of um, you know, criminals or possibly um, large animals, predators um, around their property at night. And um, light pollution causes two problems for night vision. Um, first of all, it causes our pupils to constrict. So we're letting in less light, which means we can see less. And another thing that intense lighting at night does, um, the rod cells in our eyes, which allow us to have vision in the dark, are overwhelmed. They just can't handle light as intense as this. Or the example earlier of, of um, high beam headlights coming at us. So once you're accustomed to driving at night or being outside walking at night and you lose your light vision, it can take quite a while before it comes back again. So the people that own this property, uh, they have this very intense light on this wall 
and it's providing a lot of light um, throughout this side of their property. You can see it's not shielded at all. The light's going all over, very bright glare, and it looks pretty good. But in reality, it's obscuring the fact that this um, possible intruder is looking inside the gate here. Um, so if we, if we were to block that light, now we see the intruder. So when people consider security as a reason for night lighting, they have to be careful about um, shielding the lights and also tilting the lights so that they um, don't have this wasted light and prevent them from seeing um, possible um, um, security threats here. So um, even if people don't um, care about the effects of light pollution on the environment, they don't care about astronomy, they may not care about the effects on their own health, they may not care about the effects on wildlife. If you start talking about cost benefits, um, then a lot of people will wake up. So um, this graphic talks about energy waste from light pollution. So it says that about 13% of residential electricity used in the United States is for outdoor lighting. And typically, um, a house would use a half kilowatt of, um, of electricity for outdoor lighting at night. And that would be enough to actually power a 50-inch plasma TV for one hour. So we need you know, um, a source to produce that electricity, uh, coal, natural gas, uh, nuclear wind power, some of those produce CO2. And about 35% of light is wasted, either because um, it's not shielded and the light's going all over, or it's not aimed where they really need it. So sky glow is a result of that. And this 35% of light waste, it translates into about $3 billion per year worth of energy lost to um, sky glow or other forms of, uh, of light pollution. That equals about $10 for every man, woman, and child in the U.S. every year. So even if people are not interested in controlling light pollution for other reasons, if we um, mention a cost benefit, sometimes that um, changes their mind. So how are some ways that we could reduce light pollution? Um, well, one of the keys is to use only the light that you need um, where you need it. So some ways to do that would be to shield the fixtures to avoid light spill. And we'll look at some of those fixtures in a minute. And also the fixtures that we have, to direct them or tilt them so that we keep the light on our property. Uh, we only want to use the light where we need it and not have it going to our neighbor's property or someplace else. Um, another thing we can do is, is um, ocean sensors whereby the outdoor light would only come on when it detects some motion, or light sensors where the lights um, come on, say, at sunset and go off automatically at dawn. So I'm sure many of us have the experience of driving around and seeing outdoor lights still on like at 12 noon, which is, is wasting money. Um, we could use timers like smart devices. I have some light uh, grow lights in my home for plants uh, which I schedule um, by using Amazon Alexa. So we have different smart devices and apps that we can use to control the light more efficiently. And you can also get colored LED lights, um, such as Amber, which still provide the lighting, but are not as intrusive. And all of these would save money. Um, so this graphic um, shows the area that they intended to light which was this yellow um, triangle here. This is what they were hoping to light by putting a fixture up high. And it's not tilted very well. So because of the tilt of the fixture, light is going um, upwards. It's also reflecting from, um, say, concrete or sidewalks below going up. Uh, it's providing glare for anybody outside the zone that they intended to light and it's producing light trespass on um, this residence or structure over here. So it says light pollution is often caused by the way light is emitted from the equipment. Choosing proper equipment and carefully mounting it, aiming it, can make a big difference. So shielding lights and tilting them are two big factors in controlling light pollution. 
Um, we talked about the LEDs a little bit earlier, the light emitting diodes, and they have a lot of benefits uh, because they use less electrical power. Um, they lower carbon emissions because we don't have to produce as much electricity. Uh, they save on your electric bill. If we're shopping for them, instead of um, shopping by looking at the wattage, like we used to do for the incandescents, we want to look at lumens, which are a measure of brightness. And we'll, we'll look at that further in a minute. And nowadays, they also have smart bulbs, which you can control with an app in terms of uh, brightness or dimming, besides turning on and off. So um, this graphic shows a potential savings from a 750 lumens LED bulb. So it's estimated that this would cost um, $1.26 a year to operate old incandescent. Um, based on three hours a day, it lasts 22.8 years. And the light appearance, um, this one is 3,000 Kelvin, which, which isn't too warm. And it would only use um, 10 and a half watts of electricity. So there, there are big benefits to using LED bulbs. Um, this is a comparison chart that shows um, the standard uh, incandescent bulb on the left and the newer LED bulbs on the right. And it compares them uh, according to lumens, brightness, uh, lifespan, and cost savings. So if we just look at one row, say the first row, um, a bulb that produces 450 lumens or brightness, the old incandescents, that would be a 40 watt bulb. But to get that same amount of brightness with LED is only six watts. Um, the lifespan of that incandescent would be maybe a year, depending on how much you used it. The LED could last 12 to 25 years. And the savings from using that LED could be up to 90%. So there's a big incentive for people to switch to LED bulbs. Um, this graphic um, is a, a package label. I was shopping at Lowe's Home Improvement up in Odessa, walking down the electrical aisle, and I didn't even realize there was such a thing as high definition LED bulbs. So I stopped to look at this one. And according to the manufacturer, in this case, uh, General Electric, they say this lasts twice as long as their standard LED bulb, and of course a whole lot longer than the, um, the incandescent bulb. So I didn't even know these existed. Shows you how up to the uh, times I am. Um, dark skies lighting directs the light to where we need it, um, avoiding lateral spill towards other properties or upward spill towards the sky. So in the left-hand graphic, we have a light fixture about halfway up the wall of this building. And the useful light um, is kind of limited. It's the yellow portion here, and it's producing some spill light. If we were to take that same fixture and move it up to the top of the building, also tilt it down more, it produces a lot more useful light without wasting as much light. So um, the location of the fixture and how you direct it is a big factor in controlling light pollution. Uh, we have another comparison here of um, an unshielded light and fully shielded. So you can see on the left-hand side, this unshielded light, the light is radiating 360 degrees, whereas presumably they just wanted it to go down towards the base. So it's wasting you know, most of the light. Um, some of that could be saved by partially shielding or capping that light. Um, if we shielded it halfway, um, it prevents a lot of sky glow going up, but there's still a lot of wasted light below. So the ideal situation would be have a fully shielded light where it only directs the light um, emission to where you want it, which would be, say, the sidewalk at the base of this light. So in addition to positioning and tilting the lights, shielding makes a big difference. So in this graphic um, on the left-hand side, we have part of a pamphlet that was produced by the um, town of South Southampton, New York on Long Island. And on the left-hand side of this pamphlet page, they have examples of uh, unacceptable or discouraged lighting, basically lights that are unshielded or only partially shielded. And on the right-hand side, they have examples of lights that, um, that 
they do recommend. So the whole idea is that the light source, the light bulb, does not extend below the shielding. We want it to be completely up inside the shielding. So if we look at these two examples on the right, a regular outdoor light might not have any, um, any shielding on it. The light's going off in all directions. Whereas if it has um, a shield above the bulb and the bulb is fully enclosed within it, it's only lighting the area that you want down below here. So major retailers um, like Home Depot, um, Lowe's Home Improvement, they have actual dark skies friendly light inventories uh, that you can shop. Um, they have them in the stores or online. And even the local, um, the local sources like um, Morrison's True Value or Higginbotham's, if they don't have dark sky friendly light fixtures in stock, they can certainly get them for you or you can go to their websites and order them and have them delivered to the store or to your home. So dark sky friendly light fixtures are becoming um, more prevalent, more numerous and more um, accessible. So dark sky ordinances, um, in 2011, the Texas legislature revised their local government code to require counties that are located within 57 miles of the McDonald Observatory to adopt um, orders regulating the institution, the installation, and use of outdoor lighting. So the whole idea was to protect the um, research work of the observatory. And this is aimed primarily at um, the, energy, uh, the energy industry, the oil and gas producers. So it's one thing to pass the law, it's another thing to enforce it. Um, when I lived in Reeves County, um, the light flares from gas wells were getting closer and closer to my home. Uh, so I wrote a letter of complaint to the, um, the county commissioners there. Never got an answer. I, I suspect they got a good laugh about it. So recognizing that this was not being enforced, um, last year, 2019, the Railroad Commission, which controls the oil and gas industry, uh, put out a notice to uh, those operators, um, but they need to be minimizing lighting impacts um, on their on their um, on their on their installations, their wells. And I know some um, of the industry companies have been receptive to this. I've heard that Apache um, Drilling, for example, has been receptive to this, and they've actually found that their workers like the dark sky friendly lighting better because the glare is not as intense and less likely to be tripping over hazards on the job. So there are benefits to these companies. Um, the big benefit, of course, being to save money if we can get them to, um, to embrace dark skies lighting. So um, we have a few dark skies certified state parks in Texas. These are certified by the International Dark Skies Association. What what's right in our area, Big Ben Ranch, which I believe achieved that in 2018, and there's some others elsewhere um, in the state. Um, so Parks and Wildlife recognizes that one of the benefits of people coming to a park is to be able to see the stars, see dark skies. Um, this picture to the right, I'm pretty sure is the, um, the lighthouse formation in um, Palo Alto State Park. Um, but I think, well, I have camped out there and you can see the sky glow from nearby Amarillo um, in that state park. So I don't know if this is um, an example of that, but Palo Alto is not dark sky friendly at the moment, but these others are. So um, these are some links for those that are interested in stargazing if you're at a Texas state park. I'm not gonna click on any of them now because my, um, my internet connection would take forever to, um, to load. But you can look these up and find out more about uh, dark sky events in the state parks, um, stargazing techniques, and Parks and Wildlife has their own um, initiative um, to try to promote dark skies. So we come to you know, the question of what can we do? And I have um, a quote here from a book I read recently. It says, no one of us is as smart as all of us thinking together. And I put in a part in parentheses, acting together. And another um, statement below that, small actions by many people 
can have a big cumulative effect. So we as individuals might think that, you know, there's not much we can do about dark skies uh, being lost in dark sky lighting. But actually, if a lot of people did little things, um, it could have a big cumulative effect. So a few of the possible steps we could take would be to use less um, outdoor lighting, but only use the light that we need. Um, at my house, I have three outdoor fixtures, and I very rarely use any of them. Um, almost always when I'm outdoors at night, I use like a miner's lamp, which puts the light just you know where I need it when I'm feeding animals or doing outside chores after dark. Uh, we said we can use smart de devices like um, um, Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant or others to schedule the lighting. So it's if we forget, it comes on when we want it and goes off when we want it. We can use sensors like motion and light sensors. Um, if we're not really ambitious, all we could do is change a light bulb and that would make a difference. Um, we could take um, a lower lumen bulb, or change to a lower brightness bulb or a tinted bulb. The LEDs come in different tints that you can use, which are not nearly as intrusive as the white light. Um, we could also replace fixtures with dark sky friendly. And I mentioned that the um, local energy companies are offering incentives to try to get people to do that. Um, and one of the things we want to make sure we do is temperature so that the light is only being used on our property, not on our neighbors. Um, and if we have a neighbor or a business nearby that is um, guilty of intrusive light pollution, depending on how brave you are, you might want to gently suggest um, that they could do something about it. And probably the big um, incentive here is tell them they could save money. Like even if they don't care about anything else, if you tell them they could save money with dark skies lighting, um, sometimes that that's, gets their attention. Um, these are just some of the references that I plagiarized from. Uh, so far, none of these people sent their attorneys after me. So, um, we hope you enjoyed this presentation. We hope you would stimulate um, um, interest in supporting the observatory's dark sky reserve for the West Texas counties. Uh, we hope you liked it. If you didn't like it, too bad, because we're not offering refunds. And um, that, that pretty much does it. I quit, Laura. Or anybody. Laura, you're muted. Uh, okay. Everybody unmuted now? All right. Yes. <laughs> Artie, that was really excellent. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. You're welcome. Well done, Hello. Marty. Yeah, this is Guy. Uh, I agree with Lisa. That was great. In fact, one of the questions I would like to ask is, um, can I get a copy? Is this PowerPoint? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So I've got PowerPoint, or uh, I'm, and I also have Adobe Acrobat, so I can take PowerPoint and save it as a PDF. But uh, there's some great references in here, some great um, materials to use, uh, even in just trying to fix my own home. So um, I'd love to have a copy. I think uh, maybe I Laura that. intends to make uh, the recording uh, available. Um, is that correct, Laura? You're going to make the recording available? Yeah, I'll, I'll put the recording in the uh, Tierra Grande do uh, Dropbox. Okay, I have, I need to, um, and forgive me, Marty, when, when I first read through this, I I'm made an error. Um, the, the ordinances, when it, when the state of Texas first gave uh, counties the power to write their own ordinances. It was any county, any part of which lies within 57 miles. That's why we're able to snag Culberson, Hudspeth County, because it's way out there. Oh, because part of Hudspeth is, is any, in- Any part of which. Any part of it. So, oh, the edge of it is 57 miles from- Yeah, the, so- Cool. That's and I, I'm, I missed that. I'm sorry. Good to know. Good to know. Um, 
I do I see Bill in the corner yeah, back there, yeah. Janice? Yes. He he's been on another meeting. <laughs> cat. <laughs> cat the cat cat patrol. Um, Bill, how many how many acres do you estimate if the uh there there might be if the um dark sky preserve is actually becomes a reality i mean oh, yeah. one one chunk at a time i know but what's the ultimate goal uh, yeah i seem to the, the number of thirteen thousand acres uh that's the combination of jeff davis brewster and presidio um it doesn't uh take into account the possibility of land south of the river joining in on this application, although that seems to be an increasingly um, um, hopeful possibility. So 13,000 square miles. 13,000 square miles, whoa. It, it will be far larger than all the other dark sky reserves in the world combined. Wow, larger than all of them combined. Yes, ma'am. It's amazing. That's amazing. Um, anybody have any questions? I have, before everybody wants to, to go um, and run off and, and um, wait, where'd we go? Did I lose you? Hello. Mm -hmm. Where'd we go? Here you are. Um, sorry. <laughs> I have a, we put together a quick poll and this is just a feeler. I just want to see how polls work this is a nice small little group and it's just real quick four question poll and I'm going to pop it up and I'm going to launch and can you see this yeah yes all, all right so this, these are yes no questions and how did we do so four if you guys want to just take a second and do yes no or can I add, um, like to Guy asking about getting a copy of the presentation, it'd be nice to have those references, not just in a recording. So maybe you, we could look up some of those references. Sure, I'll, I'm gonna type that into the met, to the notes here so we don't forget that, okay? okay. Get a list of references. Yeah, Marty, you did some great research, found all kinds of good stuff, good, photographs, good references and things that really illustrate very well, make it really clear so that we could theoretically take this out to public public events or companies and show them some of those things and um, get a lot of questions answered in a hurry. So I can tell you did a lot of research on that. Thank you. Yeah, that was one of oh, my questions. Um, yeah. Go ahead. One, one of my, <laughs> sorry, one of my, I'm going to jump in. Let me jump in. One of my questions was if, if people, whether it's for them or if they knew somebody else who might be interested in having this kind of a presentation at, I don't know, a company meeting, a gathering, or, you know, it might, doesn't have to be a live presentation. We can set it up and do it as a Zoom for a different group of people. So, Anyway, that was my question. If you guys have any suggestions, you, you're totally welcome to email us, email me or Marty, and um, we, we'll be happy to talk with you some more. Okay, has everybody voted on the polling? I'm gonna end, ending polling. Thank you so much. And um, Laura? Yes, sir. Um, a couple of people asked for a copy of the PowerPoint, so I, I would just need their emails or I don't know how we could handle that so I could send it to them. Well, I have everybody's email because they signed in through the, because uh, uh, they answered the, uh, uh, the email that I sent out. So I have that. And then who wanted the, who wanted the copy of it? Guy and Ann, right? Guy did. Guy, okay. <laughs> Is it possible to get a copy of the entire presentation? You have to ask Marty, he owns it. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm, Marty, <laughs> I'm asking. 
Uh, yes, that, that was the intention to send you the, the, the entire PowerPoint. Excellent. Okay, so Jill, you want a copy of the, the PowerPoint? Uh, of the entire presentation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Guy again. Marty, if you would send the PowerPoint to me, I will save it as a PDF because PowerPoint is a purchased software package and PDF can be read with numerous free readers. So that sounds good. I will do that, Guy. That's very good. So why don't we just send it to, to everybody that way, and especially like if you have PowerPoint, you can extract the pieces, like the one where it shows the, the night sky encroaching on the entire US. I would like to pull those out and show them to somebody just because. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little bit of ru nose rubbing, eh? <laughs> Hey, the facts, you know. <laughs> how, how about we turn it into a PDF and then send it? It's it's be easier just to do it all in one fell sweep. Okay. I can do that. Marty, is it the same one that you sent me before? Is it the same version that you sent uh, me? No, the one I gave today is no. This one I did today is a little bit souped up. This is a different different okay. version. I'll send you this one. Okay, all right, and then I'll turn it into PDF and then I have everybody's email address so I can just send it on lickety split. Great. Okay. And I can put the live one in the Dropbox, but I don't know if anybody's gonna watch it again, except Marty. <laughs> <laughs> live one is good, that would be good to have. I'll put it in the Dropbox, and you know, so if you guys have access to the Tierra Grande Dropbox, you can you can watch it there. If if there are instructions for some of these things in general for uh, Tierra Grande, it would be helpful if we had instructions on how to do that written out. <laughs> instructions for what do you mean? To how how to use the Dropbox? Okay. That sort of thing. Okay. Uh, written out so we can, you know, put them on our Rolodex if we want to or whatever, uh, or our digital Rolodex. So when we forget how to do it, which I do, uh, it'd be real nice to be able to pull that up. Uh, Lisa, I think I think Tierra Grande has to give permission to people who aren't already on the list to access the Dropbox. So, we'll, we'll I'll team up with you and make sure that uh, you get that happens. Well, if you know, I, communication is always the big issue. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll do that. Well, it is, and you're absolutely right, Jill. If it's not something you do fairly often, it's you know, I, I forget how to do a lot of things because I don't go that often. So I'm right. pretty sure I can pull all that together and figure it out and get it out to you. Uh -huh. Good, good. If we have a problem with Dropbox, can I get it from you another way? I'll talk to you, Lisa. Okay. Sure. I know that not everybody has the greatest um, internet access, so Sometimes we have to resort to old fashioned technology like printers. <laughs> and United States mail, which I'm sure you could have it probably by maybe September. 